So this is the power of compile time resources. Uh, I'm going to give an overview of some tools, some libraries, some techniques, a real world use case, and hopefully some inspiration. If this is not the talk you intended to be in, I suggest that you go make a break for the elevators while there is not a line right now to get back down. Okay, uh, this is who I am. I'm Jason Turner, host of C++ Weekly. I was host of CBPcast. We uh, stopped the podcast a few months ago. Um, I've written some books. I have a couple to give away here, so if anyone says anything particularly insightful, you get a puzzle book. And I am a developer, still, not... Uh, I don't do only training, I also do development. And let's see, I'm a Microsoft MVP as well. Kate had that in her opening. Uh, Kate, I think you've been an MVP for longer than I have. Yeah, I think I'm on 17 or 18 years. 17 or 18 years, wow. Okay, uh, so this is what I do. I do training, I do code reviews, I do consulting. Now, I do like to say move to the front in my talks because I like to have an interactive session with you all. And please interrupt me along the way and ask questions. Don't hold your questions to the end. There's no reason to. Um, and if you're interested in having training from me, this is kind of how my training setup looks like as well, except smaller rooms, of course. Right, power of compile time resources. So let's give a little bit of a backstory. Uh, rich code for tiny computers. This was a talk I gave at CVPCon in 2016. It was kind of a look at the power of the optimizer and zero cost abstractions. Then in 2017, Ben Dean and I did a talk called Constex for All the Things, which is a proof of concept, compile time, JSON parser. Um, it wasn't production code. And then in 2018, I did this talk called Applied Best Practices at CVPCon again. And uh, I kind of figured what happens if I follow all of the best practices that I tell other people to do. And I accidentally made an ARM emulator that was completely runnable at compile time with ConstExper, uh, which thereby, you know, it's almost QED, you can do anything at compile time. If you can run an emulator at compile time, you can do anything at compile time. Uh, bringing a little bit more to today, C++ Weekly episode 233, I did a comparison of ConstExper map versus standard map. So this is if you knew the data that needed to go into your map at compile time, what's the difference look like? Uh, and then your new mental model for ConstExper, which I did last year at CVPCon, and that was a fun talk. I, Patrice liked it. Uh, and that one, I kind of try to push the envelope for what can you actually know at compile time. So I have actually the slides for that presentation are largely generated at compile time and then just presented live. All right, C++ Weekly, episode 313, the context for problem that took me five years to fix. That is going to come up in this talk a little bit. And then episode 319, a JSON to C++ converter, and that is also going to come up today. So. Just for the record, I made a little short URL there if you're curious, and I have 28 videos that I've done about compile time things. And as I've been pondering this particular talk, I think there's a chance it might be my last talk on this topic. We'll see. <laughs> Let the record state that there are groans from the audience. <laughs> okay, so what's next? We are here. Power of compile time resources. What of these compile time ideas can I actually apply in some sort of large scale fashion to a real world existing project? That's what it says on the tin, that's approximately the description for this talk. What will happen? What gains do I actually get, if any? Um, which, uh, referencing context for all the things, uh, in this one we did compile time parsing of JSON files and compile time access to that compile time parsed JSON data. It was slow to compile, it was hard to get right, and embedding your JSON was incredibly annoying because we didn't have standard embed. Who wants the ability to embed files at compile time? See, yes, this is a real problem there was, what do we have, like 60, 70% of the room probably raised their hands. We want to be able to embed files at compile time. All right. 
So just out of curiosity, do any of you work on a project where you have JSON files that are known at compile time? They're static for the life of the program. Oh, Kidoki, that's way more than I expect. <laughs> and that was like 50% of the room. Um, configuration files? Is that what they are? They're configuration files, okay. Uh, anything like JSON schema files by any chance? Couple? Okay, uh, oh, interesting, more. Uh, anything else? Oh yeah, go ahead. JSON schema? Yeah, custom. Okay. Um, anything outside of these two things that we just mentioned? CSVs. CSVs? Oh, but uh, configuration data, like what kind of world? Data sets, okay. And you said, and you work on robotics, right? Did I get that right? Yeah, but that's another story. That's a different story. Okay, Richard, yes. And multiplication tables, gigantic blobs of DSP tables. Gigantic blobs of DSP multiplication tables. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, so JSON to CVP. I said this would come up. This was a recent C++ Weekly episode. The idea is that we take a JSON input file and then generate C++ files with static const expr, constant initialized JSON data. I just realized I probably should have given the captioning team const expr. That's the main word that I'm going to say. That, does, are they getting it right? Just out of curiosity. No? I don't know. Right. Right, anyhow. Um, uh, so we generate, I, I generate with this input processing tool, I generate some C++ files. It also generates a compilation firewall if you have uh, concerns about what this is gonna do to your compile time. And I produce a compile time object model that is source compatible with the nloman JSON uh, tool. Are you familiar with that JSON library? Like, I, a lot of people are, okay. Source compatible. So I have two use cases here, two questions. And one is avoiding the runtime parsing of the JSON file itself, because very large files can take a while to parse, and then using that file at compile time. This is approximately what it looks like. I have whatever my JSON file is, gets fed into JSON to CPP, and it generates three output files. Document.hpp. Uh, this is the header file that you use if you just want runtime access to the data. You don't care about compile time. And document underscore impl.hpp is the actual data itself. So then you can get compile time access to this JSON data if you want it. And then document.cpp is a file that you can compile that simply includes the document underscore impl.hpp. So you have this compilation firewall. Do I want just runtime access? Do I want runtime and or compile time access? It's all generated for you. So if we are familiar with nloman and with JSON, am I pronouncing that right? Does anyone know? Does anyone know the author of this library? No one? I mean, it's a tool that everyone uses. We should probably figure out some way to get them to speak at a C++ conference. Doesn't that sound like a good plan? Someone should do that. Okay. I mean, for a tool that literally everyone knows, but I didn't see a single acknowledgement that, uh, that you uh, know the author. That's interesting. Okay. So we could do this runtime assertion and say, if I get the zeroth element um, and I get it as a double, then I want it to be, you know, 10. I take that nloman JSON object representation and I just dump it to some CPP files. C++ files. It's not complicated, but it does involve a depth-first recursive dump of the object, which is uh, necessary and will become obvious, I think, in just one moment. Um, so this is extracted code from the dumping process. I have something, a function called compile, and it takes the object that I want to output as C++, and a reference to the current object count, and the output file that it's going into. Um, this is, again, it's just snipped from the middle of something, so don't expect it to make a ton of sense. But I just say, if this object is a float, 
then I want to emit a double into my C++ file, into my impl header file. Uh, and then I repeat this logic for ints, bools, strings, unsigned ints, all the stuff that it supports. Questions? Okay. If it's an array, then it doesn't fit on one slide. There we go. So I say, uh, if it is an array, then I walk through all of its children, this is where the depth first comes in, and compile the children here. Um, and then once they're done, then I pop back out and I create the actual storage for the array. It's just a list of values. And then for objects, I repeat the same process and emit key value pairs. So the result is something like this. Um, the test.hpp, I said this is the one that you include just if you want the compilation firewall. You just want runtime access to this data. And, and that's really all that it is, is it is a bug on that slide. Is it? No, that's the HPP file. I'm good, never mind, sorry. Um, so it's just for declaring a function that's called get. It returns a const reference to this compile time JSON data structure. Questions? All right. Test.cpp, this is the one that builds the compilation firewall for you. It includes that impl file, and that's all it does is it returns a reference to this const expr data. And the impl file looks something like this. Now, theoretically, it supports any of the character types that and Loman JSON supports, which is why I have all these using declarations at the top of the file. And then for this simple case of just having an array of floats, it's gonna look something like this. I've got this inline const expr standard array, uh, JSON of four objects, and it's the four doubles. And then I create the object here on line 20. So just taking a quick rewind, does it bother anyone at all that I'm returning a const reference on line three? Yes? <laughs> I didn't think about that until just now, because it doesn't bother me because I've spent too much time playing with this stuff. Um, I am creating an implicitly static variable on line 20. It's good for the lifetime of the program. If I return a const reference to it up here on line three, it's fine. So I'm just creating global data that's known at compile time. Are you okay with that, Richard? Okay, good. <clears throat> Here's a quick aside, and referencing back Kate's keynote. Do you go to your local meetup? One, two, come on. Do you, do, is there a meetup in your city? Do you know if there's a meetup in your city? Now let's do it this way. Who knows that there's a meetup in their city and they don't go to it? <laughs> okay, so that's like four people. Start going to your meetup. I mean, to be fair, this was given virtually, uh, uh, this came up in my virtual meetup because obviously pandemic, we were virtual for a couple of years. Um, I had someone in my meetup question a recent episode of C++ Weekly that was stop using const expert and use this instead. Does anyone see that episode? A couple people. I, and I said the use this instead is static const expert because the point is that you don't actually want the data that you're generating at compile time to live on the local stack. You, you want it to be global data almost always. And one of the people in my meetup said, um, at file scope, if you do static const expert, then, uh, well, that creates a problem. And I'm hinting to it here. Does anyone realize what the problem is? Copy of the document. 
Every translation unit is going to have its own copy of the document. Do you want a puzzle book? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> puzzle book. Whoa. Hear myself down here. OK. So making it inline, the compiler deduplicates the static data. <clears throat> or I guess the inker does, ultimately. Uh, so the inline specifier can be applied to variables as well as to functions. A variable declared inline has the same semantics as a function declared inline. It can be defined identically in multiple translation units, must be defined in every translation unit in which it is ODR used, and the behavior of the program is as if there is exactly one variable. So yeah, you take a very large JSON data structure and you compile that into like 15 different translation units, uh, your binary explodes. We didn't want to do that. All right. So inline is necessary in this case to prevent the global objects from being duplicated. Each translation unit, whoa. Literally getting ahead of myself. Okay, so. Now, with my JSON to CVP, I can go from this at runtime with an assert to a static assert. And I can say at compile time, I want to verify that the zeroth element is a double and its value is equal to 10. That's where we are. Taking a slightly more complex example, this is a JSON document, uh, it's an object. It has a title key, a data key, and the data is an array of mixed types with subarrays. This is where the depth first recursion comes, uh, becomes necessary. Sorry. Um, so looking at, the, starting from the top, uh, I should, I really should have had that document still on the slide. Um, so let's do it this way. Starting at the top, this thing is called object data six. Now, if you recall, in the actual compile function, I passed in a reference to the current object count. That's so I knew what uh, unique name to create. So I have object data six is equal to an array of a zero and a one. So it's the very, the very first element is the deepest element, the array of zero and one. And then object data one is an array again with an int of the value one, a double the value three, a string view to hello world. Does that bother anyone? <laughs> uh, okay, I was told to, told to continue. Um, so uh, const character literals are valid for the lifetime of the program. So it's not a problem. We can create a const x per string view of a character string literal. That's, well, if you did this wrong, address sanitizer would catch you. So you're all using address sanitizer in your test, right? Oh, no. OK, we need some seriously more hands up for that one. Um, all right, so I have a context for string view, which is handy as well here, because that means that I know the width of this thing easily at compile time. It is exactly a pointer and a length. That's what string view is. Uh, and let's see, and then the bool true, and then a reference to that array. And then the next object down, object data zero, becomes the top level thing, and it is the data element and the title element. Now, uh, there's a discrepancy here. Does anyone see it? That's a very, very minor discrepancy. I only noticed it while I was creating these slides. Hint lines 10 and 11. The original document has title declared before data, and I am uh, emitting them data and then title. And that's because the JSON object model gave it back to me in this order. It uses standard maps, so they're going to be sorted string uh, value pairs. And I don't know if that actually matters. Do you ever care, or is it, are you, I'm asking you, 
can you reason about the order of elements in a JSON document in an object? Yes. Yes, you can. Yes, and you do. And you do. <laughs> so this would bother you? Probably, yes. Yeah. OK. Do you want a puzzle book? Yeah, sure. Which one do you want? I have object lifetime puzzlers and copy and reference left. Good choice. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, so that needs to get fixed somehow. OK. So that brings us to that slide. OK, so the point of this talk is not meant to be doing more work at compile time. This is not doing work at runtime. Does it sound like I'm splitting hairs here? OK, I, I don't think I am. Uh, what are some of the things that you all currently do at compile time? Generate code? You generate the code of the program. Oh, you're saying that's what the compiler does for you? That is one of the things that, that's true. Yes, go ahead. Play, play chair hockey? Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, in reference to the XKCD, right. OK, so during compile time, you play games because, OK, you have too much. OK, I meant like, uh, like static, asserts. static asserts. OK, great. Do you want a puzzle book? Yeah. All right, cool. I'm fresh out now. I'll be bringing more tomorrow, though. There you go. Yeah, so type checking, static asserts. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So validating your invariants, definitely. Yeah. Generating data instead of magic constants. Generating data instead of magic constants. So something kind of like this then, right? Exactly that. OK. Um, so that tends to be what we think of as, const, uh, as uh, compile time work. And this is where I'm just trying to say, yeah, I've talked about this a lot. I'm just uh, trying to talk about just using some data that you were somehow given at compile time. This is about the end result of moving that data to compile time. OK, is it time for the actual use case yet? Yeah, I think so. I'm doing pretty good. Um, <laughs> I had a friend just point out to me uh, that when he's watching a presentation, he, and he looks at the clock and says, you've only got 10 minutes left, and you're only halfway through your slides. It stresses him out. Uh, I think I'm doing pretty good, though. OK, so current status. I have a 9,930,795 byte JSON schema file. A nine megabyte JSON schema file. That's kind of big, I think. You care about JSON files. Yeah, uh, ours is a little bit smaller than that. A little bit smaller than that? Okay. It used to be close. It used to be close, they shrunk it down. Okay. Uh, 155,990 objects. This is from the reasoning of what my tool outputs, objects. We're talking about the arrays. Uh, so if you have an array of four elements, that's going to be five objects in my world. That's the array and the four elements, five objects. Does that sound like a lot to you, 155,000 or not? Uh, that's quite a bit, yeah. That's quite a bit, OK. I'm just going to defer to you, because you've expressed an opinion on all this. If anyone else has opinions, then uh, make them known. Uh, this thing is always known to compile time. It's always statically known. It's a schema file. It's used exactly once at runtime, because the tool that I'm talking about has its input file, which is a JSON file. When the program launches, it parses the JSON file. It validates it against the schema. That's the entire use of the schema. Uh, it is currently embedded as a CBOR representation of the data. So we take uh, in Loman JSON, load the file, dump it back out as CBOR, embed that into our binary, and then at runtime, load that CBOR file. 
Now, in case you're not aware, that blob of data still has to be parsed back out. It's not like it's a direct memory dump of your JSON object tree. This still has to be um, parsed, and the JSON object tree has to be reconstructed from that information. So the plausible future, using the tool that I've been working on, is static const expert inline const expert implicitly static objects representing the schema that's currently embedded in the binary. With this plan, there's zero runtime work, zero runtime allocations, and available on demand for the Valley JSON validator for the adapt uh, with an appropriate adapter. Some of you said you do use JSON schema files. Is that correct? You use Valley JSON or what? Do you know? No, no. Uh, it's the tool that my client used. Okay. Um, so this is what we have. Pre is a 54 megabyte binary. Post, it's a 65 megabyte binary. So I increased the binary size. Uh, pre work 218 megs of RAM used, post work 214 megs of RAM, decreased the RAM, and went from 3 million calls to new during a very simple run of this tool to 2.1 million calls to new. And let's look at the runtime from 10.18 seconds to 10.08 seconds. Massive, right? <laughs> Yes, I know, thank you. You should hold the applause till later, though. Now, um, obviously I was hoping for something more. Uh, well, we'll talk about that in a second here. This is all release build stuff. Okay, binary size increased by 11 megabytes. Why? Yeah, uh, we can just, yeah, I mean, remember that we already had the, uh, the JSON file embedded as Seabor data. Was it embedded in? Embedded in the binary, yeah, in both cases. Yeah, go ahead. From the relocations? Relocations? No, I don't think that's it. Timor, do you have your head right? Is the Seabor stuff compressed somehow? Is the Seabor stuff compressed somehow? Uh, keeping in mind that it's what, the concise binary object representation? Yeah, it kind of comes down to that. Like, how many bytes does a double? take up? Eight, yeah, eight. I mean, on every modern platform, it's eight bytes. It's a 64-bit float, uh, IEEE. Uh, how many bytes does the string 4.2 take up? Or four, perhaps, yeah. Um, three was what most people said for the sake of the recording here, but four, so somewhere in that ballpark. Um, so Seabor is a compact representation. It doesn't store the floats as strings, but it is a compact representation. Okay, RAM decreased by 14 megabytes. Why? You should be getting used to it now. I say why, now you tell me why. Yeah? Static data, what did you say was the rest? Right, it's just mapping to statically known data. I don't have to rebuild this data structure. That 11 megabyte increase in the binary is the 14 megabyte decrease in the RAM usage, basically. No objects created at runtime. And by this case, in this sense, I mean no C++ objects created at runtime. They're simply accessed. It's compile time known pointers to compile time known arrays of data. And if you're not used to that, by the way, let that sink in for just a moment. Compile time pointers to data. If you haven't played with that, it should mess with your mind a little bit. It did me the first time that I did it, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I can create a const expert pointer to a static const expert data blob. That's fascinating. All right, uh, new, decreased by 884,000. I'm just referencing the data. I have to create an object model. Um, there's no maps, no vectors, no strings. 
There's no resizing of the strings and the vectors. I had to be fair, adding a new node to a map doesn't really incur any extra cost, but adding a new element to a vector it has to move a bunch of data. Okay, runtime decreased by a consistent 100 milliseconds. Remember, you all applauded that 100 milliseconds a moment ago. Uh, it's consistent because we're, you know, just parsing the same file, right? Like, we've just removed the parsing aspect. Yeah? So it's like, is the 100 milliseconds, the 100 new calls. It's not just that, it's the actual parsing of the data as well, which actually surprised me that it was only 100 milliseconds, yeah. Uh, no, uh, so the comment was, surely it's measurement error. No, I was able to reproduce it. It is, it is pretty consistent. It is 100 milliseconds. Um, and I, I tested it with a couple of different mechanisms. Uh, so, yeah, I didn't give you my full testing work there, but it definitely, it's, it was right at 100 milliseconds on my machine. Yeah. So the question asked uh, is, what was the whole 10 seconds doing? So this is a building energy modeling simulation system. So it's actually, the, the whole 10 seconds is loading the building description file, uh, validating it, and running a very simple simulation of that building uh, energy usage. And do you know how much time is disk access? How much of the time is disk access is actually very low in this case, because the only disk access is the loading of the JSON input file. Uh, the rest of it, well, there might be a couple of resources that it picks up, but it's very minimal. Yeah. All right, uh, so we have zero parsing of the schema file at runtime. That's what we saved. Uh, and note that this is a constant. So while we might mock a little bit, I would mock myself, just for the record, at making a big deal, about 100 milliseconds. Let's talk about a simulation tool that you're running millions of invocations on a supercomputing cluster. Does 100 milliseconds matter now? It starts to matter. You start talking in machine hours, machine days of saved time. Uh, on, on, well, it doesn't even matter the size of the task. You're gonna save an exact consistent amount of time. All right, let's do a quick aside on compile time exceptions. Just waiting to see if that bothered anyone. Okay, um, I'm kind of playing with this example here. We'll build on the example in a couple minutes. But I've got a constant expert function that can just set a bit, whatever. You take an input, you shift in a bit, you set it, you or it, okay and then some validate function that says, if you have both bit, ooh, I confused myself by writing the code that way. If you have both bit one, starting at zero, and bit three, I don't know, whatever. If you have both the two bit and the eight bit set, then you get an exception thrown from a const eval function. Uh, and so, oh, look, it's right there. It's on line 15. It's bit one and bit three. That's what I should have said. So um, uh, then I'm, I'm building this value on line 14. I'm setting these things, and I ask it to validate. Okay, what does this code do? If I click on this right now and we hop into Compile Explorer, what am I going to get? Compilation error. Compilation error. Who said that? You're gonna get a compilation error. Um, yeah, so you can't throw an exception at compile time. You're not allowed to do that. But you are allowed to have throw statements in your const expr code. So if I didn't cross the streams in this example and I set bits one and four, then the code compiles. So doing compile time validation of data is actually really easy. You can 
throw a descriptive thing as to what you did. And if it hits it at compile time, you get a reason at compile time. This is like the zero effort version. But that's not really what an exception is. It's like, not. I can't use a static assert here uh, because these are runtime known parameters, right? It's not, it's not a template parameter. The fact that it is technically a, it is a function, it is a uh, function, parameter to a function, I can't use a static assert on it. I mean, I can. So if I even attempt to do something like this, non-constant condition for static assertion, you just you can't use a static assertion on a template param on a function parameter. But that's not really throwing an exception. That's really just when it hits it, you, to, you just want to know about it. Yeah, it's not. I'm not actually throwing an exception. I just want to say break the compile on this condition. It's like an assert, but you can't use C assert at all in this, in this function. Oh, no, wait. I could use it in the same place that I have the throw. Yes. Thank you, Daisy. Right. Uh, yes. So either one would work, right? Well, you know what? We're here. Let's just go ahead and do it. Wrong way. I want to do it something like that, right? Yeah. So same deal, yes. We could have used uh, an assert. I don't know why. I like the throw better. So the comment was the entire point of throw and catch is that if you throw an exception, you want to have a way to catch it so that you can back up and try something else. I'm abusing it, okay? Um, we didn't talk about the actual declaration of this function. What type of function is this? It's constevel. It has to be executed with compile time known parameters. There's no world in which I can catch this throw. Well, that's an exaggerate. No, yeah. I, okay, I could catch this throw if I called it with a compile time known parameter but did not assign the value to a constant expression. I think I could catch the throw in that case. I'm not recommending you do that. Yes, okay, I'm getting all the questions now. Wait, oh, oh wait, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. so um, if you build in release mode, yes. the assert goes away. If you build in release mode, the assert goes away. Being a const eval function, you're probably never going to see it in your build anyhow. Do we change the behavior? <laughs> Wait, what was your question? This is the one. I didn't expect this to be where we were going to get hung up. It was the same question. I was about to say that, uh, well, if you have a release build, the assert goes away. So the error doesn't. But it was a compile time calculated value. So if I have a debug build, I still have a compile time calculated value. Doesn't matter. Ooh, that's a fascinating point. Yeah, I was right in choosing throw this whole time. <laughs> So the comment was, uh, if we were to build a release build, which has dash in debug, right, uh, enabled, then the assert's going to be removed, so we'll never catch the data validation that we actually did this entire thing for. So yes, we're using throw. All right. Whew. <laughs> Don't applaud that. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Now I think we actually slowed down too much. All right. So JSON for compile time configuration. This scenario is partially fabricated. Let's assume we have an embedded device. We have hardware configuration options that are fixed when the device is created. By created, I mean manufactured, right? 
I know that this device is going to be configured for whatever. I'm writing some heart pacemaker algorithm or something. Um, your storage and runtime are at a premium. And you want to configure the bits to set up at runtime a port on your embedded device. Who's done some embedded development work? Oh, a small handful of people. So I mean like an I.O. port, it would be generally like eight pins that are tied together. You've got like an eight-bit port and you want to set the properties on each one. Is it an input port? Is it an output port? Do you want to uh, have an automatic pull-up resistor set on it? Or do you want it to be analog, digital, whatever? Okay. Uh, I want to set up this configuration. Set up the configuration, not set the configuration at compile time. Now, this is partially inspired uh, by discussions that uh, around 2016, I think, with Odin Holmes, with his uh, Kvisnir, I don't, it's, it's an unpronounceable word, except, does anyone know how it's actually supposed to be pronounced? Kvisnir, okay. I'm not gonna try again. We're gonna move on. Um, <laughs> and also partially inspired by the like, uh, applied const experts, a class I teach. It's pseudocode. So, we could, in theory, have something like this. We've got some static const expert. Now, this is function scope, which is why I chose static const expert here, not inline const expert. That was meant for file scope. Static const expert thing that says, well, I've got some JSON data, configuration data that was known at compile time. And I want to say, grab the bits for port A and do all of that data validation, all that parsing, whatever, at compile time. And so then on line, you know, by the time I get to line eight, I have this statically known set of data. And then at runtime, I just write that data to the appropriate memory location on the device to set up the I.O. settings for the port. My configure port function could look something like this where on line five, I say, inside this JSON config file, look up the ports object and load the port, you know, whatever the current port name is on line five. Well, if I don't have port Q in the configuration file, then I get a compile time error. I tried to look up something that didn't exist at compile time, compile time error. With a throw, Richard, <laughs> uh, and so then I loop over the things, I set some constants, whatever. I build up this bit set that I want, I return the results. If any part of this fails, if the thing called pin number is not an integer for that object, it fails to compile, just fails to compile. Zero cost at runtime. Compile time validation of configuration is easy to do, like I already showed, using exceptions. Um, and probably lower cost than whatever you're currently doing for something like this, because you probably have something that happens at runtime. This doesn't. So, this point. Now, given how you all raised your hands at the beginning, I may have miscalculated here, but I think I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, my configuration file data currently isn't in a JSON file. Were any of you thinking that? A couple of you were thinking it? Okay. That's fair. Why would it be? Because who wants to parse a JSON file, particularly to the small handful of you who are doing embedded work? So we just do something like this, right? We can just have a const expert function with some map of maps of strings to bools, whatever, and set up the things in some sort of make configuration function. That's easy, right? I'm getting a vigorous head shake in the front row. Why is this not easy? You can't just return an instance of a container to be in const expert. That is, in fact, the problem. Wrong, this is not easy. How wrong is it? Do you want to enumerate the ways in which it's wrong? Yeah, go for it. Um, 
if you have embedded, you don't have null-like possibilities, and map requires that. And that's interesting. It's one step above my concern, or below. I'm not sure which order this hierarchy is. Um, standard map isn't enabled for constexts per use at all, not even in C++23. Standard uh, string and vector are, map isn't. If you're in an embedded platform, you probably don't even have standard map available to you or string because in theory it requires malloc, even though we're not actually using that at runtime, we're only using it at compile time. So that's going to be its own separate problem. And then, as was already pointed out, we can't have a const expert reference to this thing. So in a quick aside here, uh, is this, is it, would this function compile, would this code compile? Ooh, who says this code would compile? Who says this code would not compile? I don't have a second book to give you. Uh, who is abstaining? Okay. This code does not compile. This is a compile time error. You cannot have a const expr string. More to the point, you cannot have non-trivial destruction in a const expr object. That's really what it comes down to. I just had great fun with a class last week talking about all the const expr things we can do in C++20. Uh, you can't have non-trivial destruction in a const expr value, so it's impossible to, to do this. Um, is this allowed? Does anyone know? Yeah. Yeah, this is allowed uh, because the string doesn't actually escape compile time. Only the length of the string escapes compile time. So on line, uh, so I'm creating a string from a const expr function. I'm using that string in a const expr function. But then when I actually get to assigning to a const expr value, I'm only getting the length of that string back out on line 10 and line 14. We can use it at compile time. We can't access it. Uh, we cannot create a const expr variable of this type. Boy, all right. So we need a const expr compatible map type and a way to move compile time allocations to runtime. Uh, we can do something like this. Fairly easily create your own simple vector type. This makes assumptions. It has a max size. Uh, so you can say, you know, what's the biggest this thing can, have, that can be. If it ever runs off the end of the vector at compile time, well, then you get a compile time error because you're not allowed to invoke undefined behavior at compile time, so that's good. Um, and we can just build up this vector pushing back elements onto it. Although this just is missing something. Single keyword. It's missing const expert. I forgot const expert. <laughs> I'm writing the slides. I go back and look at my own slides. I'm like, wait a minute. Something's missing. Uh, what else? Let's do the two-minute code review version. What else are we missing? What? I'm looking for, personally, no discard on these values. Uh, that's handy. Anything else that we might be missing? Oh, there could be a begin and end. Yes, absolutely. We're missing tons of functionality. I'm just doing the code review version. I could have marked some of these things no except. Anyhow, I just thought I'd show that. Okay. Um, we're going to keep things simple for the sake of these slides. Uh, so once you have a vector that you can use, you can slap together a flat map pretty easily. I'm just going to say this is left as an exercise to the viewer to make your own flat map. It's a brilliantly fun experiment. It, well, I've done it too many times, so I can do it fairly quickly. If you haven't done it, it's fun. Um, and then something like a string can be this string. Uh, line nine should have been const eval, not const expert. Uh, this string is just fixed known at compile time. It's just a way of holding a bunch of characters. So we can kind of throw these things together pretty easily, and we can end up with something like this, a flat map of strings to flat maps to strings of bulls. It's not ideal. 
Why is it not ideal? We can say, like, how many objects exist in my flat map of flat maps of strings to bowls? Or how many bytes of data approximately had to be allocated? Yeah, the max size for everything. So 10 times 10 times 10 at least, right? Uh, times 2 because of the, no, no, well, something like that. So it's a lot. It's a fair bit. 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. Uh, we have to over-provision. Now, I am not, particularly, as we're running out of, running low on time here, I am not going to dig into the details for how to minimize this. I would just say it's possible. You can go back and watch that episode on the constexer problem that took me five years to solve. That episode, 313, there are techniques. And we can get to this. So if you see, I create my over-provisioned thing, although this is real code, this is no longer slide code, I'm actually pulling this in from my local library. Uh, and by the way, all of this code is uh, public domain, and it's in my tools project, just so you know. Um, so here I say, uh, each sub-object can be a maximum of size 10. I have to give it a compile time maximum storage for it to encode into. But then I've got this tool, this library function called minimized stackify. And it can take standard vector or standard string or any of my stack-based ones that are in my library. And it creates, at compile time, a map of strings of length four, because that's the commonality there. The first thing is a string four to maps of string six, because that's the max size of those strings, to bools of a size of two. And the one represents the fact that I only have one top-level key port. So I can actually click on this. Oh, no, what do I do? Sorry, what? Shouldn't the Lambda be const expert as well? Let's, on line eight. Um, the Lambda is const expert callable because it's Ren operator is implicitly const expert. So this works. The lambda itself doesn't have to be const expert because uh, I'm actually taking a copy of it. It works. <laughs> I, I should have made it const expert for consistency, but it does work. Um, so this is where it gets really fun to me, because I can pull this up and who's heard of Compiler Explorer? OK, good, just making sure. All right. Um, I can pull this up in Compiler Explorer real quick. And let's just shrink this a little bit. Uh, and this is the entire body of my program. And this is my map of map to strings of bulls. We can read it. It is A-P-O-R-T-I-N-P-U-T. There we go. It's right there. It's, and you can even see the null terminators for the strings. And you can see the sizes of things. This is fun disassembly to read. We can just read our data structure right back out. All right. So, like I said, Something about tools, something about uh, hopefully inspiring you a little bit. Uh, just, you know, for comparison's sake, if we look at standard map, um, well, it, let's just say it generates a lot more actual code. We'll leave it at that. Um, and it's not available at compile time. It's not going to go away at runtime. You can't use it for compile time configuration of things. It doesn't have the same utility at all. So on the topic of not doing work at runtime, Ollie here this morning at 2.31 a.m. said, uh, if I need to randomly pick between numbers from 0 to 7 really fast, is there any neat way or should I just have an array of random results? Does not need to be secure. Only thing I care about is speed. Uh, Corrington said, hey, tech out one of, let, that's me, just for the record, I am Lefticus. 
Um, one of Leftikus's, uh, check out Leftikus's neat solution. So this came from a uh, C++ Weekly episode from seven years ago now. Ali says, this is beautiful. OMG, I love it. So what was Holly's solution? I feel like this is completely appropriate to this talk. Um, he creates a constexpr array of random numbers. These are actually seeded with underscore underscore time, so it will get a different result each time you build it. Um, and then all he cares about is a pseudo random list of numbers, lets the compiler do it, gets the results at, uh, at runtime. All right, so uh, if you don't like JSON but do use configuration files, what formats do you use? I heard CSV from someone, anything else? YAML. YAML, okay, great example. I'll tell you why in a moment. Yeah? XML. XML. That's a worse example than YAML. <laughs> <laughs> what? Ski? Scheme. Scheme, scheme. S scheme like the Lisp yeah. language? As compile time known, oh no, as configuration files. Are they statically known at compile time? No. Some of them are. It's been on my to-do list to make a compile time Lisp interpreter, mostly just as payback to Lisp because it was the one project I never finished in my computer science degree. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so if you don't like JSON and want something like YAML to CPP, <laughs> and you want to pay me to do it, <laughs> let me know. Okay, uh, so yeah, this is, again, my slides. I am officially, or not my slides, this is about me. This is the end of the presentation. If anyone has any questions, I am here for two more minutes. I have, I have a question and a comment. Okay. My, my comment is I wondered if it's your choice of throwing. Uh, Even if it didn't look like you were catching. Yes. Uh, you do want to defend the case? I want to like defend you, yes. Okay, oh, thanks. I accept um, that. And, you can and, talk to Richard. Yeah, and shamelessly plug my talk. I oh, talk okay, that's great. I, I do go deeper on this, and I think I probably should pop that section up in priority now that everyone was so interested in it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, constexpr doesn't just mean run this at compile time for a function. Constexpr means this could maybe might be run at compile time. Could maybe, might be, yes, exactly. Right, yeah, so yeah. you could have something that's not allowed to throw at compile time, but could definitely throw at runtime with runtime information. So that's, and, and you could catch it. You could have a reason to catch it at runtime right. that you wouldn't have at compile time. So what's the other reason to catch it at compile time? That is coming, hopefully. Is it, really? Is it? I don't think I, I don't know I don't know think it I made would. 23, but it might be in 26. No, I'm almost positive it didn't make 23, because I, I would like to think that I would have heard about it anyhow. <laughs> The question is, uh, did you think about just writing this as something that parses a compile time string rather than just generating uh, files yes. as part of the build system? I mean, that is what, what Ben and I did in 2017 with our Constex for All the Things talk was actually parsing it at compile time, but I found it to be just too much of a pain to use and too slow. Uh, particularly for something with 155,000 objects in it, it would have been untenable. Do we know if, like, Clang is going to get jitting of constexpr any day? That was a talk, like, talked about, like, four years ago. <laughs> What's that? Uh, there is a, a new interpreter of constexpr specifically on the way? Okay, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is about, like, actually... Making it usable, I guess, is what it came down to because the data set that I was talking about was just far too big. Oh, uh, we have 10 seconds left. Any other questions? All right, thanks, everyone.